Hej Salad. Hej. My name is uh, Phil Vakande and I'm here today with uh, Salad Hilaule who is an uh, artist and filmmaker based here in Stockholm but raised in Gävle. And Salad, I'm curious, if you were to explain your art to someone who's never seen any of your works, what would you say that, what would you tell them? Thank you for your question. Uh, I will tell them first and mostly it's about some kind of like uh, dialogue with the audience and in that sense that I'm trying to create a work where I feel everybody is welcomed. And in that sense it could mean, for example, a work that I did called Vanus Labor. It's a work about the Afro-Swedish diaspora in Swedish art history. So when I was doing my research and doing that artwork, who became an installation who is based an installation that is basically in film and it's in objects, but it's also in two acts. So we come into one room, we see objects where it seems to be the way people depicted black bodies in Sweden from 16th, 17th and 18th century. And you see objects of wood, you see objects of plaster. And those is basically those objects is basically objects that I found in Stockholm. And from that I also have like a video installation, a video work. In that video work, it's a work about um, Gustav Badan, basically before he became Gustav Badan, his name was Al uh, Kushi. And this person, he was uh, adopted to the Swedish uh, royalty back in the 18th of century. And he was adopted from West Indian, in from St. Bertemeli. And he was an idea of the queen uh, to be an experiment of how you raise a child. And in that sense, he became the sibling to Gustav III. And when I was doing my work about Vanus Labor, I was thinking a lot about how can I talk about a way where the Afro-Swedish people are connected into the collective history? And in that sense, art has that power. It has the way to document what has been before. And now I'm doing a very long monologue about my work, but I, that's the most recent work that I've done, Banus Labor. And in that sense, it's a work where it's connected about history, where everybody's involved. So what I'm basically working is some kind of like personal memory. It's like the memory and the place. And in that sense, it also takes in a video work, it takes in a sculpture work, but it also could be a text. It could be just plain a photography. So uh, if I'm to, let's just see if I, if I understand yeah. you correctly. So the way that this work is representative of, uh, of your artistic practice is not only the theme itself uh, and this way of interconnecting with historical events, but also in, in the way that you work with, uh, with different kinds of um, materials exactly. and also, of course, technologies. Exactly. Such as the camera and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So it's basically technology, but it's also object. And you said artist and a filmmaker. So for me, it starts with the art, basically meaning here it's a concept. I'm trying to work with this concept. And then I start to create some kind of like narrative around it. How will this room look like? How should I present it? How does people come into my room where I'm presenting this work? And then after a while, the filmmaker in me comes in because I feel like there has to be some narrative. And film, it's a practice that I've had before I studied art. And it's always been in my practice, basically, because I feel like with film, nobody has to have some kind of like pre-knowledge. Because when we talk about art, if you see, for example, a painting, then some people feel very like distressed. They feel like I should be able to read this way. I don't know how to read it. Am I allowed in this room? But when I, what you can do with film, it's basically you have all these elements. You have sound, you have image, you have like some kind of like production design. And I'm trying to basically show another world. And film, people don't like, seriously, they just like, they don't like question so much about film. They're just like, here's a narrative and I'm just going to see what this takes me. But if they see a painting, then they will be like, I have to know everything about art history. So the filmmaker in me is always trying to involve other people to be able to basically come into that room and feel like art is for everybody. 
Yes, I'm, I'm one of those people who not always feel so at home in the art world because art doesn't always make sense to me. But I'm intrigued in what you're talking about when it comes to film having a narrative because I'm thinking, in other words, you're saying that you're a storyteller. Exactly, exactly. I'm first and mostly a storyteller. And the way I work with storytelling is basically presenting in a different ways. So it could be the object who has a story about the object, but I just saying that this is the object and then people are like, what is this? Then I tell them about this object becomes from this and this and this and that. And then they get to know a lot about it. But it's always about some kind of narrative structure, yes. So that, that also makes me uh, want to continue to my next question, because when I was preparing this talk, I, I listened to the previous uh, interview with you, and in that you talked about the, and this is a quote, the individual story in relation to a larger scale, and in a way how you connect your own experiences with uh, the artistic world that you're creating. Could you elaborate on that? Thank you for your question. And, and the really nice quote, I mean, how do we talk about the large scale of history, you know, how am I able to talk about the Afro-Swedish body in the Swedish art history? And can people even listen to that? And the way we can have people to listen is like, all right, I focus on one person. This person is Gustav Badan. How about his story? How did he became Gustav Badan? What was his name before that? So from my research, I've found that I'm basically I'm talking about Van Slober again. I found, and the film work, I'm fi I found a diary that he wrote through another uh, author. And that diary, you see like how Gustav Badan is trying to talk about his life. And what I basically landed on was like, okay, in this film, we create this narrative of like, we follow this person who says, I was in this room, I felt this, I felt that. And then this day became when I became Gustav Badan. I was part of this royalty family. In that sense, then you have one individual to focus. And then you see other images where you see black bodies in some kind of like national museum. You see other places. You see some kind of way where I'm trying to make a gesture of a painting that was existed previous before. But again, this one story about this one person becomes the larger scale of history about everything else. So in that sense, that's the way I'm working because I found like, how do we talk about this big stuff? How do we talk about the theme of like, not feeling a part of the Swedish history, a part of like this society at all? And I'm like, fuck everyone and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work that way. You know, if I'm talking about something big, you have to start by telling the story about something small. And that individual story, everybody can create, everybody can relate. They can feel the same that uh, I know how to, feel, how to be like an outsider. And that's how people start listening, basically. Yes, uh, the word I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm listening to you is, yeah. is scale. Exactly. How, how you're using uh, the story of one person as a case study or almost uh, like a lens. Exactly. And then through that lens, you can uh, uh, examine uh, matters that are maybe on a global scale, exactly. uh, on a historical scale but it makes, makes sense, it becomes understandable uh, exactly. through the story that you're telling about this one person. Exactly, and then also when you have a person who doesn't know how to be able to read this art gallery or this art installation, they just go to the film and then they have one story that they, oh, this is the story about this. And then suddenly they just feel calmed down. And, and then again, it's about like, how do we even talk about this big stuff without having one story? Uh, and also, in the same <laughs> interview yeah. uh, that, uh, that I saw with you, uh, that you did in the past, there was this other word that, uh, that kept um, reappearing in your conversation, and it was dialogue, yeah. uh, the dialogue that you engage in. Could you explain also a bit about how you think about or how you concept uh, conceptualize the concept of dialogue? Yeah, I mean, what is dialogue? You know, if, if we talk about dialogue, for me, it's like, okay, me as an artist, I have to think about who is my audience. So every time when I think about who is my audience, then I'm trying to have a dialogue with my audience. And that's how it works for me. I'm not saying that other artists should do the same way. I'm just saying that when I basically wanted to be more an artist and when I feel like everything clicked for me, was like when I got to feel like, all right, just, just be you, you know? And how, how do you want to do this? How do you want to be able to show your art? by basically, I want to show my art basically by having a dialogue, having to say like, 
hey, you're welcome here. And me and you, we're going to have this conversation. And in that sense, I'm thinking about how is this person coming in? What are they going to see? How are they going to watch this stuff? Is it on the corner there? Is it on the corner there? Or is it up on the roof? And in that sense, this dialogue creates about how does this person come into the room? How do I tell a story where this person feels they can basically understand? They don't need to understand everything, but they can go away with some little bit of understanding. And if they don't do that, then they feel something at all. They, I mean, so, f- at mostly they feel something. And from that, they go away from the room. So in that sense, dialogue for me is always to think about your audience. Who are you showing this to? And And there are some other artists who feel like, no, I want to be internal. I just want to focus on what I feel and how I basically show. Uh, I mean, basically, there are internal feelings. And then they create this and then they show it. But for me, I I can't do that. I have to be able to, like, what is the audience? Where is the room? How is this room? How do people come in here? And just keep going on, basically. But it also sounds like you're engaging in dialogue with the material, uh, exactly. with the uh, archival ma- uh, material, with uh, historical material. And because, of course, you're not only reflecting a story that's been taking place, but you're also recreating it uh, and curating it in a way, I would say. Yeah, totally. I mean, what is archive and how do we relate to archive? I mean, is archive basically someone who presented everything else? And, uh, and in that sense, when, when I'm an artist, I always tell people, like, I can be this archivist. I can say to this archive, how about we look at this? And someone who's basically some kind of, um, who's been studying in another way, who's been studying in an academy or something, they have another, basically, another feeling towards it. But me, as an artist, I can be the archivist, and then I can be the narrator. And trying to basically create something else that we hasn't, seeing the way, I mean, basically present another way to see the archive. And also, again, I want to own the archive, the way I've been presented. If we talk about black people in Sweden, what is blackness in Sweden, then I'm trying basically to understand that. And how can we present that? And in that sense, I have to be be able to see what's been archived about the black people here in Sweden. And I take that and then I tell everyone, "Look look, look at this way. I'm not saying it was wrong that you did it this way. I'm just saying, how about if you look at this way? How can we present the archive in another way? And that's, for me, it's more interesting. And that's where I am. For me, that's when everything is also getting something to me. But I'm not saying that everybody should do that way. I'm just saying the way we basically take care or take, take in the archive, I'm, I want to present something else, basically. An archive, I would argue, is uh, a form of collective memory. Exactly. And in that way, it holds many different kinds of voices. Uh, And some are maybe more heard than others, depending on how you work with that archive. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Totally, and that's a collective memory. And if we, for example, look at, again, Vanus Laber, we have Pierre-Louis Alexander. We have a painting of this person who used to be a model in the Swedish Art Academy. He was basically a model for all the art students. And when you see his, the painting of him, I'm thinking about, okay, here's an archive, here's a document of him, that he existed. What does he feel? How did he live his life? And then that's the way I started creating like a narrative to the archive, instead of thinking, oh, they want to make him exotify. They want to exotify him and his body. Look at the violence they're putting him into. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. Because they don't know that it's a model, they want to create this idea of this person. But for me, it could be also, but me as a black person, if I look at this, I'm like, yeah, they're doing this, I've seen it before. But who is this guy? And how did he do his everyday? What did he eat? How did he walk here in Stockholm? You know, so that's how I'm starting creating this archive and thinking about it in another way. And maybe that's also what separates you as an artist from a, from a historian. Exactly. Because a, a historian wouldn't be able to do that with the archive. And I'm thinking, because in, um, in the field of literature, there's been uh, an ongoing debate for a few years now about uh, autofiction. Exactly. About using one's own experiences in fiction. And I'm thinking, in a way, there's a parallel to what you're doing and using your own experiences in, um, in relation to the archive. Exactly. And seeing how that resonates. Exactly. And I'm, basically what I'm doing, autofiction and a speculative fiction, saying that, can we see the speculative fiction here in the archive history, basically? And do you see, do you see your work as part of, uh, 
of a growing influence or like a shift in contemporary art in, in, in the Nordic region or globally? That's a real good question. I mean, in that sense, I mean, when I was in art school, I was trying to figure out like, what is my place here? You know, instead of like seeing the art Swedish art history, okay, we have these people and these people, but what is my place? What can I contribute? What can I talk about? In that sense, then I also look at the, the, the British, the Afro-British, like people who's been doing a lot of these questions like blackness. And then we have also the Afro-American. And in that sense, I've been basically looking what they do. And there's basically, there's been this, not trend, but there's like this shift in contemporary art where we talk about the archive through blackness or other history, like queer histories. And, and from that sense, I've been seeing a lot of stuff basically like, oh, there's another way to look at this because there's another queer history. There's another, another history that we don't know, a hidden history. And that shift, I think like, in the contemporary art world, now everything starts shifting through that, through that, start questioning like the history of the art history. Can we look at it this way? And yeah, there's, there's, there's the shift. And here, especially in Nordic region, because I feel like sometimes we see what the other bigger nations do. And then we start to like emulate them. But still, we also have this way of the Swedish way to do it, the Norwegian way to do it. So basically, I see the art world also like this ongoing conversation, but it's also again a question about what is trend. I mean, you can see a trend that was for 15 years ago, then it looked that way, and now this is the trend, and how we will look in 10 to 15 years. You mentioned the queer archive, and uh, many scholars claim that what really defines the queer archive is uh, the lack of materials, because oftentimes it's been underground, and yeah. it's been maybe... Uh, oral history and so forth. So, so there are actually quite few objects as part of that exactly. archive. It's exactly. more uh, an archive of affect or emotion or yeah. you know constellations. Is that something that you can relate to? That this archive that you're talking about is not always part of the official archive. Yeah, totally, totally, exactly. I mean, I have to go dig even deeper, and I have to also like do some kind of like being historian myself mm -hmm. to be able like I haven't seen this way presented. But also, again, I have to think about what is like the gaze and how do I look at, if I see a painting and I see, for example, again, Vanus Lauber, this David Klöcker Ehrenstrahl, it's about a painting that has six white children who basically taking care of their friend, who's the black person who's in the middle. And if we think about the queer history, then we can see a lot of other paintings where we see this bodies of men or women together and you, and if you really start reading those paintings then you start to seeing like ah the painter want to do that what is this room maybe what this room was a special room for people who knew so in that sense you can read the archive in that sense but also again it's it's super it's, it's about archiving stuff and, and and in that sense the other bodies or the other narration of queer history or black people or or something else it hasn't been documented but i think now it's start creating this documentation of and trying to create a new archive and also uh, i would argue i think that it's not only about understanding what the painter wanted to do but it's also about viewing the archive in a new way exactly and looking at it from maybe a new perspective and in that way maybe querying the way that we've entered the, the yeah, archive exactly exactly querying the way we i totally agree i mean and, and and it, that, that's, I found super fascinating. I mean, I mean, now I think it's also like, if we think about the contemporary art scene now, there's a lot of shift happening. And I think uh, it's super excited to be part of that, basically. Well, thank you a lot for coming here and having this conversation with me. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you.